Thank you. Thanks a lot, Sam. So I hope you don't mind I came with my assistants. And as you can see, the organization is growing. So we're going to put them in here. If they would like to stand in here. There you go. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. What a great presentation Sam did. It's fantastic. It's such a pleasure to see that people are really working in these difficult areas with these species that are so endangered, like the macaws. So um, today, um, in my presentation, I want to show you why penguins are a fragile group of seabird species. I'm going to show you the different species, their characteristics, the problems that they have, and what we are doing at the Global Penguin Society to help them address these issues. So, I always wonder why is it that penguins, that most of the people like penguins? What is the attraction that we have with the penguins? And sometimes it's because they walk upright, or maybe because of their tendency to waddle when, they, when they're walking. Some people say that they look so well-dressed that we identify with them, right? <laughs> but, you know, there's some special connection with the penguins. And maybe it's also because of their devotion with their partners or with their chicks, because they have to make their living, they have to commute to find food, and they, find to, they have to feed their chicks, right? But I want to show you that penguins are not only cute. Penguins are the lead, one of the leading species, the leading indicators of the health of the oceans. And what about the oceans? We all have some special connection to the oceans as well. 40% of the humans we live close to the ocean in all the world. The oceans cover 71% of the planet. They provide oxygen and food, and they regulate the weather in all the planet. So you can see the importance of the ocean. And uh, the other thing is that life on this planet began in the ocean. And we all depend on the ocean in many different ways. We are connected to the ocean spiritually, emotionally, and also evolutionary, and in a well extent, economically. And I think I work to protect penguins and oceans thanks to my grandmother. She married my Greek grandfather, and they both went to live in southern South America, in Argentina, in a region called Patagonia. And she used to go with horses and wagons at the beginning of last century to visit them. And when I was a very small kid, she used to tell me these very nice and warm stories about these penguins. And somehow she left like a deep message inside of me. And that message activated when I visited a penguin colony for the first time. And let me tell you, I knew that this was the mission of my life to work with the penguins and to protect them. And you can imagine the connection that I felt. I was surrounded by half a million penguins, which was the size of this colony. So in those years, the, there were 40,000 penguins that died due to oil spills in Patagonia. So I used to collect them from the beach, and I had a little rehabilitation center. So this is, this is me 30 years ago, and I am feeding one of the penguins that are under rehabilitation. As you can see, it is oil, right? in all the body. These black spots are all oil. So I decided to study biology and to, to complete my PhD studies to be able to, to work in a more efficient way and help them better. And I always like to, to tell that I owe penguins a lot because I met my wife thanks to the penguins. I went to this very remote island in Patagonia. I worked to work with the penguins, and there she was, Laura. She's a marine mammal biologist. She was working on the, on the sea lions. So we met, and we had our two kids, Germán and Alejo. And the landscape that you can see in the back, this is the place where we met and the place we, where we currently work. But the kids have grown, <laughs> just like the penguins. So this is Germán. He's 20 years old now. He's studying uh, economy. And this is uh, Alejo. He's 18, and he wants to become an engineer. He wants to design uh, engines powered by clean energies. So we, my wife, we made sure that they're going to have a role in conservation, even in economy and engineering. <laughs> but 
Penguins are not only important to me, and I want to show you why they are important to all of us. Because penguins are a fantastic indicators of the health of the oceans. And penguins are warning us in their own language that the oceans are in trouble. In fact, 60% of the 18 species that exist in our planet are listed as threatened by the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. Penguins are remarkable. They can live from frozen Antarctica up to the tropics in Galapagos, in the Galapagos Islands in Ecuador, and they breed across islands and continents throughout the southern hemisphere. Some penguins live in the open, like the penguins that live in Antarctica. Some others live in desertic areas, like this humble penguin from Peru, among the cactus, as you can see. And some others live in the forest, just like those macaws, you know? <laughs> This is New Zealand. This is uh, the west part of New Zealand. This is the place where they filmed the Lord of the Rings. So can you find the little hobbit in the picture? <laughs> so the penguin is here. You see the penguin there? So these penguins, they nest in caves under trees and logs. Uh, so it's very difficult to find them. It's very difficult even to find them, to count them, and to work with them. Hmm? And so let's meet the penguins. As, as, as we all agree, the most famous species is the emperor penguin, right? That's the reason why they are my assistants here. The emperor penguins, they breed in Antarctica, but the most amazing thing is that the males, they incubate the eggs in the middle of the winter in Antarctica with 60 degrees Fahrenheit below zero. Can you imagine that? This is amazing. And they have been featured in many Hollywood movies, you know. The March of the Penguins, which is the biggest money-making documentary ever, and also Happy Feet that kids know a lot, right? There are other species of penguins that live in Antarctica, mostly four. The chinstrap penguin, also the Adelie penguin, and you have this gentoo penguin, which is the only penguin species that is really thriving and is considered the winner of climate change because it is taking advantage of the changes that they, we are seeing. Then you have a group of penguins that are called crested penguins and they have this fantastic, they look like aliens. They have these fantastic crests and colorful eyes and bills. This is the northern rock hopper. They live in an island in the middle of the South Atlantic Ocean. And the smallest one is the little blue penguin. They live in Australia and also in New Zealand. In New Zealand. And this penguin is really small. The adult size is one foot tall, compared to the emperor, which is four foot feet. So as you can see, there is a wide variety in the habitats they use, in the size, in the colors, uh, and also in the shapes of the penguins. And the rarest species of all is the Galapagos penguin. The population is under 2,000 pairs and they haven't been able to recover the population. So in the last 30 years, 14 species of penguins became more endangered. They have been moved to a more severe conservation status. And this is because penguins have particular features. They lay only one or two eggs per year, and they take several months to raise their offspring. So if they lose the eggs of the chicks, they lose the complete year. So their populations cannot recover very quickly. In addition, they breed in colonies, so they're all breeding together in one spot in one moment of the year. So they are more exposed to some threats like oil spills, for example, or, or a disease that can spread very quickly because they're all together. And this is one of the most important characteristics of the penguins. They do not fly. Hmm? Penguins lost the ability to fly, an ancestor used to fly, they lost the ability to fly in order to improve the ability to dive under the oceans. So let's see. Do they really, is it true that they don't fly? Because when you see them under the water, they fly under the water, you know, which is another fluid just like the air but they prefer to go under the ocean and not go so much flying like the macaws, you know? <laughs> so anyway, so they are so well adapted to live uh, under the water that an emperor penguin, they can dive 1,600 feet 
under the surface of the ocean. They can hold their breath for 23 minutes. Human beings, we can do that for four. So compare that. And a Magellanic penguin, the ones that are in Argentina and, and in Chile, it is a bird 45 centimeters, during one, a lifetime, they swim a distance that is equivalent as going around the planet 12 times swimming. Hmm? So that is amazing adaptation to the, to the marine environment. And the only thing, so in, in this image, the, the problem is that the penguins, they have to swim hundreds and thousands of kilometers to go to get the food hmm, for their chicks and for themselves. But then they have to come back to, on land and walk all the way to their nest, see? Because they cannot fly. And in some areas, like in these areas of, of New Zealand, the penguins, they have to climb rocks and go through very difficult terrain and going through obstacles and logs until they go with the food and feed their chicks. So the challenge for the penguins is that, imagine, they swim hundreds of kilometers, then they go on land, then they have to make a big effort to go and climb rocks without flying to go with the food that is pre-digested and then feed their chicks. The challenge here this is a video that shows a mother that is feeding both chicks. So as you can see, the mother is feeding the chicks, you know, and is regurgitating that food. The challenge here is that if the food falls on, on the ground, it will not be picked up. So the chick will have to wait for the next meal, which can happen in days, see? So this is very unusual. Can I go back? I want to show you the, the other videos. So this is the image when they land with the food in their stomachs and they have to go back and climb rocks, you know? They cannot fly, so they have to jump. This is a big effort for an animal of this size. So they go through this difficult terrain, through logs and obstacles. Sometimes they have to walk up very steep slopes. But this guy was lucky enough to go to his nest and see his first chick when it was hatching, see? Thank you. This we saw. Excellent. So due to all these characteristics, the penguins are facing the main threats the oceans are facing, which are climate change, marine pollution, and fisheries mismanagement. Climate change is changing the pattern of ice formation and melting in Antarctica. So that affects the availability and the quality of the food, and also the quality of the habitat that they need to breathe. But climate change is also affecting species that live outside of Antarctica because it is changing the availability of food and it is increasing the frequency of very severe storms in moments where the chicks are very, very vulnerable. In this image, this image was taken right after a big one of these storms. This is a desertic area. There shouldn't be a river here, but the storm and the river took away and killed many of the chicks. In some of the cases, the nests were flooded, and in this age, the chicks are not waterproof. So they get wet, they get cold, and they die from hypothermia because they lose their body temperature. Oil spills have killed thousands of penguins in four continents, and it is one of the main reasons of the decline of the African penguin in Namibia and South Africa. This is an image taken in 1920 in Namibia, the same day the image was taken 90 years later, and there were no more penguins here. The, color, the, the, the global population collapsed from 1 million to 21,000 pairs now. Large-scale commercial fisheries have removed enormous numbers of fishes from the southern oceans. And this is also one of the reasons of the decline of the humble penguin from Peru and Chile that collapsed also from over 1 million to 25,000 pairs now. So, as you can see, penguins are very sensitive to all these changes in the oceans. And when we study penguins, we can have a first-hand information about what is going on out there. This penguin is dead because it was caught during a fishing operation. And in some cases, penguins die because they are caught in, in, in other kinds of garbage or marine debris. So this, all these problems are caused by humans. So we need to work with people when we work with, in conservation, right? So this graph 
in this graph, I want to show you how the human population grew during the last 12,000 years. And as you can see, there were very few people in this planet for a long time, but in the last few centuries, we have a very rapid growth. Incredible. And to give you some examples, 12,000 years before Jesus Christ, during the last ice age, there were only 5 million people in the planet. Can you imagine? I don't know the population of New York, but this is half, more or less, right? 5 million in all the planet. When Julius Caesar was ruling the Roman Empire right after Jesus, the population was about 300 million. When the United States declared the independence, the population in the planet was about 800 million. When the Apollo 11 and the men reached the moon, the population was 3.5 billion, right? And today, which is another historical milestone, this expo, <laughs> the population is 7.5 billion people. So this is a clear message that human beings, we need to learn how to coexist with the wildlife that lived here and how to respect their habitats and also how to learn to make a wise use of the resources that we need as people. But the great news is that people have this very strong emotional connection to penguins. So penguins can generate this public interest and catalyze political support to implement solutions. And the most important thing is the penguins are a charismatic species. So they are the perfect tool to inspire changes in the actions and in the lifestyles of the people. This is the reason why we created the Global Penguin Society, which is the first and only organization dedicated exclusively to the conservation of the 18 species of penguins. We work in science, in management, and also in education. We have projects currently in four uh, countries, in New Zealand, in Ecuador, Chile, and Argentina. For example, in this case, we are tracking for the first time the feeding routes and the food sources of the Fjordland penguin, and we are using this information to propose protected areas in New Zealand. In Argentina, we have in one of our field sites, this is another video, okay? <laughs> so in this place, we have a system that identifies the penguins and weights the penguins. So we know when the penguin is leaving to the ocean, how much do they weight? You know, and, they, and when they come back, the system weights them. So we know the weight and the time and the identity of each penguin. You know, they go through this circuit that is under the ground, so we don't have to be there. But we've been having problems, and we went to check what was going on. And we saw this gang of penguins trying to unplug the system from the solar panel. <laughs> He's pulling the cables, now the system is disconnected, and it doesn't work anymore. So. Larry, Curly, and Mo are happy now, <laughs> and they go home. Anyway, sometimes we need to deal with people, sometimes with penguins. So one of our last products was this book. We work with 50 people from 12 countries, the best colleagues, and we compile all the information about penguins and their conservation. The book was the best seller in the University of Washington Press. It's available in our book in Spanish and also in English. And this is a great story I want to share with you. 2008, I went with one of my students, Luciana, and we discovered a brand new colony, only six pairs. The place was a mess, used by reckless people, careless fishermen, garbage all over the place. They would, take, they would throw garbage everywhere. They would set bushes on fire to make barbecues. They would take dogs that were harming the penguins. So we decided to start working in this colony. There was so much garbage that some penguins got stuck in the garbage. This one has a plastic bag around the neck and couldn't breathe properly. So we started organizing cleanup campaigns with the community and kids before the penguins come to breathe. So this is called cleaning the house of the penguins. So this is the image before. You see all the garbage all around the bay, and this is the image right after. These are seaweeds. This is not garbage anymore. Then we work with the government, with uh, landowners, with the communities, and we were able to designate a wildlife refuge for this area. And the great news is that we were able to <clears throat> help the landowners to start an operation that is giving jobs to 12 people from the community. 
it's a very good ecotouristic uh, operation here. The colony grew from six pairs in 2008 to almost 2,000 now. So this is a great home run. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So that's the mother. Now she will go and take the eggshell out of the nest. As you can see, and if you pay attention, the feathers of the chicks are still wet because he was in the egg, and he cannot open the eyes because he's so small now. And now it's time for a good nap and a good rest. So this is something that I wanted to share with you because when you witness something like this, you realize that everything makes sense because this is a clear example of a concrete conservation action that can do so much different. Penguins thrive, people have jobs, and now people that can go and see these penguins, we enrich their lives with these wildlife spectacles. So this is a win-win situation and a concrete conservation success. But we don't work locally, we also work at larger scales. And we were able to designate the largest UNESCO biosphere reserve of Argentina. It is placed in Patagonia, close to where I live. This is Chile, this is Argentina, here is Uruguay, so you can see. This area has got 8 million acres, which is roughly the size of Maryland or Belgium. And uh, it protects 40% of the global population of, of the Magellanic penguins because it includes 20 colonies. But it protects almost 1,000 species, marine and coastal, including many seabird species, some coastal species like this flightless duck that is endemic, terrestrial endemic species, many species of mammals, like this puma, for example, and also many marine mammals like southern right whales or dolphins. So this is also a great example of how penguins can be a vehicle for integrated marine conservation and benefit many other species as well. And the icing of the cake is that after that, last year, we were able to designate and create a marine protected area that protects the feeding ground the feeding areas for the largest Magellanic penguin colony in the planet, which is Punta Tombo, and almost one million penguins are using this area to eat. And we are very strong about and concerned, and we focus on the, our educational program. The highlight of our program is that we take kids from local communities to visit the penguins for the first time. Some of them, they live 20 minutes far away, they've never seen them. We want them to value them, we want to, to take care of them, because they're gonna decide about the future of these penguins. One of our partners was Disney, and they make this very short video that reflects the activity. Gracias a tu compromiso, Global Penguin Society está organizando diferentes actividades para que los chicos conozcan un poco más sobre la vida de los pingüinos. Realizan visitas guiadas, talleres y charlas, donde lo más importante es tomar conciencia sobre el cuidado del medio ambiente. Tu compromiso se convirtió en realidad. El cambio comienza por vos. El momento es ahora. Penguins and kids, what else, right? <laughs> so I want to, thank you. I want to highlight the last sentence of this uh, video, which is change begins with you. Time is now. It's time to take action. It's time to participate. Participate in life is what, is what living is all about. We need to get engaged and protect the wildlife and our planet. In this presentation, what I've shown you is that there are many problems, of course, but there are many solutions, and I've shown you some conservation uh, stories, successful conservation stories. You have a leading role in these stories because they would never exist if they weren't, if it wasn't for your support. And um, in this, as you can see, this is a big international effort. We work in, in many countries, so it demands a lot of time and effort. And what I want you to say is that we need your support. This is your success. We wouldn't be there if it wasn't for you. So we need you to support the Global Penguin Society so we can raise our voice and take action about the conservation issues that are important for the penguins, for the people, and also for the entire planet. Thank you so much. <laughs>